we have a word of prayer to start. All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful that you love us, that you came to bring life and bring it more abundantly, that you said you wish above all things that we might prosper and be in health, even as our souls prosper. And Lord, as we share together today, we pray that your glory will shine forth, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to do the screen share thing here where I get my um, slide up so you can see it. And uh, I'll turn on the first slide here. And uh, when self is the enemy, autoimmune inflammatory disease. And that's maybe a kind of a funny name. When self is the enemy, I've discovered the enemy. And it is myself. <laughs> And uh, why is this? Well, auto means self, immune is your immune system. And so, yeah, it means the immune system is sort of attacking yourself. And uh, the result is inflammation because that's the immune system's most uh, predominant way of dealing with the unknown enemies. So we become our own enemies in autoimmune disease. And how did we become our own enemies? Well, we'll talk about that. But let's talk about what these autoimmune diseases are. There's quite a list and I've kind of made a <laughs> messy slide of them, I guess, but uh, there's everything from multiple sclerosis to asthma, psoriasis, uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, scleroderma, type one diabetes, allergy, uh, ulcerative colitis, uh, lupus, uh, polyarthritis nodosa, inflammatory bowel disease, fibromyalgia. I mean, it's just a partial list here, but uh, and so your immune system has gone crazy, and and I've batched these all together, and how can I include them all in one big talk? They seem so different, at least in their names. Well, when I was in uh, medical school and I went on a rotation on, uh, on general medicine, they kind of laughed and said, well, you know, the rheumatologist, they do 100 tests on everyone with every disease, and and in every one of those tests that they do when they come back, there's 93% of them or 93 of them are all positive. And it's just a different 93 than in a different disease. And I'm thinking, well, that's a very, you know, maybe derogatory simplification. But well, what it really illustrates is that there's a huge amount of overlap. I mean, they all seem to have the inflammation, whether it's uh, a... Uh, uh, C-reactive protein or uh, CEDRATE or, or other inflammatory markers. And so, yeah, they all have a similarity. Now, so if as your immune system is hurting you, general medicine says, well, let's wipe out the immune system. Let's give steroids. Let's give immunosuppressive drugs. These days, let's give, uh, um, you know, um, antibody uh, drugs or, or drugs that have antibody reaction in them. And um, so it makes you wonder, was our immune system, you know, a problem? Is it like your appendix? You just take it out and throw it away and do without it. And, and what's the purpose of the immune system? Well, some of you may have heard of uh, Bubble Boy. This was a young man that was born without an immune system. His older brother had been born without an immune system and died shortly after birth. And they did some... Uh, uh, testing on him before he's born to know whether or not he'd have an immune system and discovered he had no immune system. And so they had him born in a very sterile environment and then placed him in a, a bubble, this plastic uh, thing you see here. And so he's only accessible from the outside to these like these rubber gloves you see this lady using here. And uh, he lived in this bubble free from any germs for quite a while. Here you see he is a teenager. Even NASA got involved and made him a space suit so he could go outside, but uh, he is, went outside for a little bit, and then he was scared that he would get uh, pathogen and, and didn't go out much more. All to illustrate, you do need an immune system. I mean, if you don't have an immune system, even antibiotics that they use for bacteria don't work. You need your immune system. And so without the immune system, you're in trouble. So let's just look at the different levels of the immune system that are necessary uh, for fighting pathogens. And then we'll talk about how they get haywire, what goes wrong, and why. So first, your first defense against uh, 
disease is your skin. Uh, you see, your skin is more than just a plastic bag, although it's a very good barrier, kind of like a plastic bag, but, but it's got all kinds of antibodies on it and, and a bit of an acid uh, um, uh, pH. And uh, it also has, uh, has, has, has ways of protecting you from invaders. And so it's an interface with your environment. It's a protection. If your skin gets breached, if you get a hole in your skin, if you get a thorn through your skin, like you're working with roses, and you get a thorn in your skin, it hurts, it swells, it gets warm. That's all signs of inflammation. And so the body, when it gets attacked by something and it doesn't know what it is, its first response is inflammation. Inflammation, I call it the inflammatory response. New injury, new antigen, new bacteria, new virus. It's going to cause inflammation. And in the background behind the words there, you see cells all gathering around blood vessels with inflammation. And so the inflammatory response is very nonspecific. It's sort of like a shotgun approach. Unknown enemy, pull out the big gun, blast away, and... Well, the result is bystander harm, damage, uh, collateral damage. Um, and so it doesn't just kill the bacteria, it kills everything, including you. And this is uh, part of the problem. And so we have to get the body trained a little more. When the body has seen an antigen or is more tuned up, it tends to use cellular immunity. A certain bacteria shows up, a certain cell, white cell, goes over and devours that bacteria or sends out an antibody to, to identify that bacteria and take it out of commission. And the antibodies are in your tears, saliva, skin, lungs, places like that. So just to illustrate graphically here, again, uh, your skin is the lowest level of your immune system. When the skin gets breached, then you have inflammation that uh, acts rather non-specifically to destroy any uh, invader. And then, if you have the highest level of your of your immunity working, it's going to be working with cells and be very specific. Uh, example to compare the inflammation to the cellular immunity: inflammation would be like World War II and carpet bombing with uh, big airplanes full of lots of bombs, and they dump them on a city, and they hit everything. Whereas cellular immunity would be more like Desert Storm. Um, send a rocket bomb down a laser beam into a smokestack, into a certain door of a building. I mean, just very precision. And so you reduce collateral damage. You reduce bystander injury. And... So what happens, though, is people have a, a, their immunity and they start engaging in lifestyle practices that reduces their cellular immunity so it isn't functioning, and pretty soon the body can only function with inflammation. And then when they function with only inflammation, they go to see their doctor, and the doctor gives them an immunosuppressive drug, whether it's a non steroidal anti-inflammatory pill like Moltron or Naproxen or ibuprofen, or if they give them a steroid or or one of these newer um, anti-immune drugs, then they're just going to function with just their skin. Then they argue whether or not they can give these people a vaccine unless they die of what's in the vaccine because they really have no immune system left. So our job is to reverse that process to send you back up from just your skin or inflammation up to working with cellular immunity. That way you won't have way too much inflammation. So our question then is, what perturbs the immune system? What perturbs the immune system? Here we have a gentleman, I say gentleman, soldier, medieval soldier, with his uh, shield, but he's also got a funny spiked ball. And he's going to use that funny spiked ball, not on the enemy, but on his own soldiers to see how good their armor is. And it's sort of perturbing them. <laughs> and so what perturbs the immune system? What stirs it up? What gives it trouble? Well, top of the list is psychological stress. That's right. Psychological stress drives the immune system crazy. Makes it 
makes it really have suicide, I guess you'd say. And uh, so people with jobs with emotional burnout are much more likely to come down with an autoimmune disease or cardiovascular disease, which is also an autoimmune disease. Um, and, and most people who do come down <clears throat> with an autoimmune disease have had a major stressful event within the last two years. What's a major stressful event? Major stressful events would be like uh, getting married, losing a job, getting a new job, moving to another house, moving to another uh, state. Um, um, I mean, there's all kinds of, of different uh, major life events that can be considered stressful, even though they might seem positive, like having a child or losing a child. Uh, well, losing a child wouldn't be positive, but anyway. So they would have this major stressful event and then within two years come down with, say, rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, so this is something that uh, we have to keep, take into consideration. When people show up with that, one of these diseases, we ask them, you know, what went wrong? And there's been books written on this. Don Colbert, MD, writes the book Deadly Emotions, where he tracks uh, some of these uh, associations. Sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. We're told nine-tenths of the diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. Perhaps some living home trouble is a, like a cancer eating to the very uh, soul and weakening the life forces. Remorse for sin sometimes undermines the constitution and unbalances the mind. You remember the paralytic that got let down through the roof on four ropes on his bed? And uh, his big problem was, was sin was the, was the underlying reason for his, his disease, which could have been like multiple sclerosis or some other paralytic disease that's uh, considered autoimmune. So we have to think about the emotional impact. We have to think about what to do about this. And uh, we've, uh, we'll touch on that maybe in other talks because uh, that's a big one. Now, otherwise, physiologically, one of the things that raises inflammation in the body is uh, traffic jam. What's traffic jam? Well, perfect health depends on perfect circulation. But if your circulation slows down and gets congested, what actually happens is the inflammation increases. And the Japanese have called this uh, blood stasis uh, inflammation syndrome because the blood slowed down, the inflammation went up, and as a result, the whole body gets inflamed, and then you're more likely to come down with an quote unquote, autoimmune inflammatory disease. And uh, so things that will slow your circulation is a sedentary lifestyle. You sit too much, tight clothing, you got tight bands around the waist or the chest. Uh, and then there's cold extremities, insufficient clothing on say your ankles or your legs, or your arms. A lot of people run around with bare arms or bare legs uh, sh wearing shorts or even you know, T-shirt when they should have something on their arms all the time, pretty much. Even in weather that seems uh, fairly warm. Unless the weather is warmer than your body and there's no wind, then you probably should have clothing on your limbs, equal clothing on your limbs as is on your chest, abdomen, and pelvis. So another thing that's very important to autoimmune disease is circadian rhythms. See, there's clocks in your body. We call it uh, chronobiology or, or your biological clock. And uh, when you do things on time, those clocks can run steady and be well synchronized. But when you do things out of timing, then it messes up with those clocks. And what happens is your clock for your melatonin and your clock for your cortisol get out of sync. They aren't, uh, uh, you know, we were trying to figure out how to get our clocks synchronized between here and where you are there and, um, and all the hours in between and, and how do we get it? Well, this is what happens with the circadian rhythms. You get them messed up. So the clock running melatonin doesn't match up with the clock running cortisol. And this is a classical finding in rheumatoid arthritis. Their melatonin and cortisol clocks are out of sync. And this is considered a big uh, you know, part of the root of the cause of the rheumatoid arthritis. How do you synchronize your clocks? The way you synchronize your clocks is you keep your meal times at the exact same time every day. Come, uh, you know, 
we say hell or high water, right? Um, always. So if breakfast is at seven o'clock on Monday, make sure it's on seven o'clock on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I mean, it's like it should be every day of the week, the same time. We're told it better five minutes early than five minutes late. If you read, you know, uh, inspiration. And so meal times. People who keep their meals at the exact same time every day have less inflammation. People who keep their meals at the exact same time every day sleep better. Uh, they have less diabetes, less heart disease, less cancer, and so and less autoimmune disease, as we're talking here. And so meal times and sleep times. You don't want the sleep times to vary because when you vary them, it definitely messes with your melatonin. And so getting sufficient sleep, getting sleep at the same time, Good to get to sleep at least, uh, uh, you know, a few hours before uh, midnight. We're told that uh, two hours of sleep before midnight is worth four hours of sleep after midnight. And it's true. People who get to bed by nine o'clock have much better melatonin and much more predictable when it will rise in early morning than those who get to bed by 1130. And so getting to bed by nine and getting eight hours of sleep is very important if you have an autoimmune disease or you want to avoid one. Some people work shift work, uh, three days a week, they work 12 hours and they work from like, uh, you know, midnight to, to noon or something. And uh, then on the other four days of the week, they do what everybody else does on a regular schedule. That will cause all kinds of health problems. Shorten your life, increase your risk of cancer, all kinds of things and autoimmune diseases. So keep on a regular schedule snack attack and people love their snacks fried potatoes salty snacks desserts processed meats these things cause oxidative stress whole body inflammation oh can you think of a snack food that would be healthy well i just told you it wasn't good to eat off schedule so no there's no good snack food there's nothing you should eat between meals not a morsel should pass your lips between meals right now, there's other things that raise inflammation. And the classic one is ice cream. I call it ice cream parlor woes. And why ice cream? Well, they pump air into that ice cream, oxygen. And the ice cream itself is milk, eggs, and sugar. And, and it's got lots of cholesterol. And so air causes oxidation of that cholesterol. There are trillions of molecules of oxidized cholesterol in one quart or one liter of ice cream. And so... Oxidized cholesterol promotes tissue inflammation, cell death on the walls of, of blood vessels. And uh, this, is, this is a huge cause of inflammation. I mean, just a very huge cause of inflammation. So be very aware of this. I mean, uh, and let's just talk about this oxidative stress. Uh, I call it oxidative stress. That's, so what's oxidative stress? Well, oxidative would suggest oxygen, so we'll use oxygen because it is an oxidizer. It's not the only oxidizer. Don't just get hung up that it's only oxygen, but oxygen is it. And why is oxygen an oxidizer? Chemically speaking, oxygen is missing a few, two actually, electrons. And so it's hungry for electrons. So oxidized means it's missing electrons. And so when it goes it goes in contact with other molecules, it's looking to steal electrons. And when it steals them, then it oxidizes the other uh, molecule. So the, uh, a common molecule to get oxidized is cholesterol. So here's the way it works. Oxygen comes along and it takes a bite out of cholesterol and cholesterol then becomes oxidized or in other words, we call it a free radical. It's missing a couple electrons. And so it goes looking for something to steal electrons from. And so it comes along to a cell and it takes a bite out of the cell, steals some electrons from, from say, the, the surface uh, lipids of the cell. And then the cell has a hole in it because uh, it uh, damaged the, 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 the molecules making up the cell wall. And so then when the cell has a hole in it, it leaks out its guts. What are its guts? Well, nuclear proteins, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, uh, nuclear antigen. Oh, 
So when you get autoimmune disease, what does the doctor go looking for? Antibodies to single strand DNA, double strand DNA, nuclear antigen, nuclear proteins. Really? So why did your body make antibodies to those things? Because the cholesterol oxidized the cell, broke open its membrane and its guts fell out and the body said this is foreign and made antibodies to it why did this all happen well it happened because you ate fried food well it happened and all these things we talk about here it happened because you weren't on a regular schedule it happened because you weren't eating enough antioxidants it happened because you aren't attending to the health of your cells and the cells are falling apart and the body's making antibodies to all the falling apart parts so fry at your own risk. Anytime you fry stuff, you're making trans fat, you're making acrylamide, you're making peroxidized lipids right there. You're making free radicals before it ever gets in your body. And so these byproducts of frying are the stimulators of inflammation leading to increased autoimmune disease. And so trans fat from frying is found in partially hydrogenated vegetable oils as well, margarines and shortenings. And uh, this is a very dangerous time, type of fat. Anytime you fry anything, you make trans fat. Even when you roast things, if you take nuts, which are high in fat, and you roast them, it makes a certain amount of trans fat rather than eating the nuts, you know, raw. Better to eat the nuts raw. And so this is, you know, a very interesting thing, these, these free radicals. Condiments raise the inflammation in your body. Spices. Minced pies, cakes, preserves, highly seasoned meats, uh, gravies, pickles, salt, grease. What's grease? Like coconut oil, like uh, lard, pepper, uh, mustard, ketchup, uh, or tomato sauce, as some countries call it. And so these condiments, with all their spices, raise the inflammation in your body, and you end up with more, well, really, autoimmune disease. So how about salt? Let's talk about salt. What happens when you take excess salt? We know it makes your blood pressure go up, but it actually causes inflammation in the lining of your blood vessels. It causes inflammation in the wall of the blood vessel. And what happens then as the wall becomes inflamed and then the inflammation turns eventually into scar tissue and the blood vessel becomes hard like, well, hard like bone and the calcium collects in it. And then you look on an x-ray and you see more calcium in the blood vessels than you do in the bones. And so this was all an inflammatory process. Well, there's blood vessels everywhere in your body. And some of these diseases are nothing but inflam inflammation in the blood vessels. Systemic lupus erythematosus, otherwise abbreviated just as lupus, is just inflammation in the blood vessels. Blood vessels of the face, butter, 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 butterfly rash, blood vessels of the kidneys, interstitial nephritis, blood vessels of the, you know, the, the skin. Uh, you get uh, temporal arteritis, and it's all from eating, well, in this case, too much salt. And what about hot peppers? Here we have pictured some hot peppers and some not so hot peppers, but, but spices, red pepper, black pepper, Increased stomach acidity, leading to cell destruction, micro bleeding, and inflammation. And then you're going to end up with more and more inflammation spreading to the whole body, and your risk of autoimmune disease goes up. Red pepper increases stomach acid by 700%. What's an example of red pepper? Cayenne pepper. Are you telling me I shouldn't eat cayenne pepper? Yes. Even as a medicine, right? It's better to put it on topically as a poultice then to stick it in your stomach. Now, could I have crackers with my soup? What are crackers? Well, they're usually a grain product raised with, 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 with baking soda. What is baking soda? Well, baking soda is a chemical when mixed with something that's acid, it puts off gas bubbles. Well, what's the result after the baking soda has mixed with acid and put off gas bubbles? The result is a buffer, something that keeps the body from going acidic. It's like an antacid. It makes it so that you cannot digest protein, for example. So alkali substances such as baking soda, baking powder, uh, when they come in the stomach, make it twice as hard for you to achieve the same acid level in your stomach, and you can't digest 
your food. And so baking soda and baking powder are associated with a 190% increased risk of stomach cancer. And a cancer often results from stomach acidity, irritation, inflammation, and then finally to ulcers as the mucosa breaks down. So you don't want crackers with baking soda. You want to make your own crackers without baking soda. Sort of a flatbread or a non-rised cracker or a cracker raised on a pizza stone or a baking stone. Now, another thing besides salt is MSG, monosodium glutamate. Any inflammation in your body is increased by MSG. And this would be like in Chinese food, the fast foods. Most fast food joints in America have MSG in their food, whether they be Italian or Mexican or, or uh, you know, uh, Mongolian or whatever. And so the inflammation uh, is increased by these excitotoxins called monosodium glutamate or MSG. Also, any of the, of the relatives like NutraSweet, otherwise known as uh, um, aspartate. And uh, they, they increase inflammation. And so you're more likely to have an autoimmune disease. And if you already have an autoimmune disease, they exacerbate it, you make it worse. But there's other things that people eat a lot too, and that's sugar. Sugar is going to increase the inflammation in your body. It'll increase the inflammation overload. And, and But you might th be thinking, I avoid sugar. But a lot of people don't realize where their sugar is coming from. For example, a breakfast consisting of a bowl of cornflakes with skim milk, a piece of toast, and a glass of orange juice converts almost instantly into 16 teaspoons of sugar in the bloodstream. Well, that's going to cause just as much trouble as if you did eat 16 teaspoons of sugar. And so 16 teaspoons of sugar will increase the body's oxidative stress and inflammation by 240%. Of the sugars, refined fructose, as found in a lot of drinks or cooked items, a lot of pastries, candies, um, most anything here in America, definitely increases inflammation, especially in the liver. So we're looking at, uh, you know, cholangitis or, or other liver inflammation, inflammatory problems. And so fructose activates inflammatory mediators and in the blood vessels and in the liver and making autoimmune disease more likely. Well, let's just put it in perspective. Let's think about the sugar in and of itself raises inflammation by 430% in a study done uh, a few years ago. Uh, cholesterol, such as found in an egg, will increase the inflammation by 360%. Saturated fat, like animal fats, increase it by 310%. Soft drinks with their fructose, increase it by 300%, and vegetable fat by 22%. So the vegetable fat would be a lot better than, of course, the animal fats, but uh, it still isn't negative. It's positive, and it's increasing inflammation. And um, now I have to ask you a question. It's a serious question. Do you have any skeletons in your closet? And what do I mean by skeletons? Well, by skeletons, I mean things you don't want there, things that you're trying to hide. And one of those things would be mold. Mold in the environment increases the risk of autoimmune diseases. Why is that? Well, mold is, is a fungi, filamentous fungi. What are examples of filamentous fungi? Well, that would be like black mold. That would be like mushrooms. That would be like uh, yeast. Uh, anything in that family, filamentous fungi, is loaded with mycotoxins, aflatoxins, products of its metabolism. And these things will increase your risk of autoimmune disease. For example, asthma by 180%, rheumatoid arthritis by 360%. You don't want mold in your environment. And, and things that uh, foster mold are as if you have shade trees close around your house, shrubs close around your house. Uh, in other words, the sun can't get to your house decaying leaves. So right now we have leaves falling off our trees everywhere. So I'm going to have to get out there and rake them up and run them through a, a mulcher and make them into make them into mulch for my garden. But anyway, I don't want my garden then upwind of my house. I want it downwind of the house so that the wind blows the, the decaying leaves. 
well, gases off somewhere else. Uh, compost heaps, sauna baths, wet basements, swamps, lowlands. I was talking to one gentleman. He was having autoimmune disease issues. I said, where do you live? Oh, I live out in such and such a state. I said, do you live near a swamp? He said, oh, yeah, I live near a swamp. I said, really? I said, that's why you got autoimmune disease. And uh, had another family came to me with a child that had lost all their hair. Their hair just fell out. And I knew an autoimmune disease could call it, cause this. I said, so has your child ever grown any hair? They said, well, one time in the last two years, she went away to summer camp for two weeks and she started growing hair. Then she came home and it all fell out. I said, really? Where do you live? Well, they lived in a little valley with not much sun and a creek going through the valley. And it was always wet under their house. And there was mold under their house. I said, uh, boy, that's the problem. They said, what do we do? I said, sell the house. They looked at me like they were shocked. We just paid off our mortgage kind of looking. We don't want to sell our house. And uh, I mean, you can't live with mold. I mean, it, it's just, I've had people tell me, yeah, I got away from the mold and uh, my autoimmune disease went away. It's, uh, and, and, and then, but you might be thinking, I don't have a moldy environment, but people eat food with mold in it. Here's pizza, you know, with the cheese and, and aflatoxins formed in a process of aging and fermenting are a source of inflammation. Cheese, wine, vinegar, uh, anything that's created with fermenting, rotting, spoiling. I mean, the list is quite long and we have a whole lecture on fermented foods, but, you know, uh, chocolate, vanilla, brown rice, syrup, uh, coffee, those are all fermented products. And so when the, inf what, is in what is inflammation? I mean, what is fermentation? It's inflammation in your food. It's disease in your food. It's overgrowth of pathogenic uh, microbes in your food. And then you eat it, you're eating pathogenic microbes and their, and their waste products. And, you know, surprise, surprise, you've got an autoimmune disease, or at least what you're calling autoimmune disease. Um, might really be an infectious disease. So cheese is really what the bacteria did to your, you know, your milk product. Your milk product started out white and the bacteria got in it and basically they peed in it and they made it yellow. And now you're going to eat it and you're really eating dead bacteria and their waste products. And it's high in fat and the fat is decayed or, 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 or putrefied. And they made it into a chunk by adding aluminum dust to it. And you have this chunk of cheese. And you're going to eat it, and it's going to cause inflammation. Uh, we had one lady, she was eating lots of cheese. She had asthma, had had asthma her most of her life. We said, you got to quit eating cheese. She quit eating cheese, and surprise, surprise, within one day, her asthma went away. Oh, I, I was quite surprised. Usually it takes a little longer than that. But anyway, another way people get to infl inflammation in their bodies through rotted products is vinegar. And they put vinegar on their salad. And uh, people ask me, well, what about, uh, you know, can't I eat uh, apple cider vinegar? Isn't it much, much better? What's well, much better if uh, you are, uh, you know, well invested in a company that sells it, but it's not good for human beings. It's uh, where did it come from? Well, rotten apples. Well, why don't you be more natural and eat the rotten apples? Well, I don't want to eat rotten apples. Why not? It's the same thing in the bottle. Well, what happens if I take a rotten apple and throw it in with a batch of good apples? What happens to the good apples? They all go rotten. What happens if I put rotten apple juice on my salad and eat it and put it down where it's warm in my belly? It all goes rotten, including me. Oh, and if I want to create ulcerative colitis and autoimmune disease or Crohn's disease and autoimmune disease in humans, I just give them, well, in rats anyway, I give them uh, vinegar in their colons and they will develop that disease so I can study it's it you know how it might react in human beings in other words vinegar causes those diseases so if you're using salad dressings breads whatever with vinegar then you're going to get an autoimmune disease I mean it just seems pretty obvious right what about the gluten connection uh, gluten has a lot of issues um and people who have already got an autoimmune disease have 10 times higher incidence of reactivity to gluten on, on, the, on the special laboratory tests. Um, 
So why is that? Well, for me, I got gluten sensitive. I thought I was gluten sensitive, but I discovered I was really glyphosate sensitive. Because in most countries, in order to predict the timing of their harvest, they spray the wheat down with glyphosate, Roundup, weed killer, and kill it so they can predict its harvest date. And um, yeah, just for the convenience of the farmer. And this glyphosate causes all kinds of problems. I mean, this could be a whole study in and of itself, a whole discussion in and of itself, a whole talk in and of itself. Um, glyphosate, I mean, the world is polluted with glyphosate. So that's a big issue. Another thing is, is that, yes, back to the inflammation from mold, a lot of the process of turning wheat into flour is associated with mold. They, instead of grinding it with a stone, they roll it with a roller until it's fine, just like making rolled oats, but they just keep rolling until they have flour. It's a wet process. It's subject to molds. Another thing is, is since we have this international economy and we ship wheats everywhere, countries who are on the recipient end of those shipments of wheat often find that those wheats during their passage over the ocean, the body of water, were subject to dampness and developed mold. And so there's high levels of aflatoxins and mycotoxins. Countries like Saudi Arabia that imports lots of grain products ends up having to test all their grain products for, for the presence or, or, the, or the levels of molds. And so that's another factor. They've also been genetically changing wheat, hybridizing it, and there's some genetically modified wheat out there. Those can also contribute to the grain problem. So the best thing, at least in my estimation, and for myself, I've found is getting organic wheat. And if you can find a farmer that's growing it and have them ship it to you directly or go to their place and get it directly, you're much better off than having it having been placed in commercial grain storage uh, facilities where a little bit of mold is going to go a long way in that facility. Now, let's talk about meat. Let's talk a little more about meat. Here I have an autoimmune disease. And on the chart, percent of diet as meat across the bottom. So the United States has about 13% of their diet as meat. And they have a fairly high rate of rheumatoid arthritis. But notice we can put all the countries on the line here. There you have uh, Czechoslovakia, Germany, Nor Norway, Denmark, uh, UK, New Zealand, Finland, United States. The more meat they have in their diet, the more autoimmune disease. I mean, that's a very good close um, approximation to a line. It's not like we put a scattered uh, graph here and and found a line through it. It made the line itself before we even put the line in there. And so more meat, more autoimmune disease. Why is that? Well, guess what? Them critters are just like you. I mean, how does the body know the difference between, you know, the, the muscles off of a cow and the muscles off of you? And so wouldn't it make a sense? You go eating the muscles off a cow and, and somehow your body makes a reaction to that because it's not good food. And then pretty soon that reaction crosses over autoimmune to you. And so you get a, a reaction to your muscles. Oh, I ate this big bunch of meat. Now I got muscle aches and pains. They tell me I have fibromyalgia. Well, yeah. So when you eat a carrot, you're not a carrot. You're not going to react to a carrot that way. But you are an animal. You go eating an animal, you're going to react that way. And so meat, plus meat is high in fat. Meat is high in all kinds of toxins and herbicides and pesticides. And so people develop sensitivities to animal project products and these antigens have crossovers. And so people who eat dairy have a 1200% higher risk of autoimmune disease or, or, or increased sensitivity. Uh, eggs and pork and fish, yes, even fish. I thought fish was the cure-all for autoimmune disease. Then they tell people with some autoimmune diseases to eat fish and fish oil. Yeah, that's not good advice because it's not going to cure anything. And uh, yeah, so don't let somebody talk you into eating fish to cure something. 
Besides, it's hard to find a clean fish these days. Where are you going to find clean water for growing a clean fish on this planet? Now, coffee is a big problem. It raises inflammation. It increases the inflammation. If you already have inflammation, caffeine accelerates it by 600%. And so use of coffee increases the risk of autoimmune disease by 120%. It's, uh, it's part of the cause. It's part of the problem. It's part of the issue. So you got to avoid it because it's just going to raise inflammation. There's good things you can use. What could I use instead of coffee? How about turmeric or ginger tea? That would be very good. Those are anti-inflammatory. And so those would be helpful. So switch your coffee out, send it hiking, and put make fresh turmeric, fresh ginger tea is the best. Or, or you know, you can get the little packets, but the fresher the better. But uh, certainly any is better than coffee. Now, another thing that will mess with your body is trying to, you know, eat everything on this table at one meal. I mean, not the volume, but the variety. Uh, so we have a, what we call potluck or fellowship meal at our, our church every once in a while. And people will go through line with a big plate and come out the other end of the line with this huge pile of one of everything on that table. And this is ridiculous. This is what will cause your stomach to go haywire. I mean, it's hard enough to figure out how to digest two or three things at one meal. Try 20 things. And what ends up happening is some things rot while other things digest. Some things are digested better with a high acid, others not. I mean, it's just different enzymes and your body gets all confused and you end up causing leaky gut syndrome and, and that increases inflammation. You end up causing all kinds of problems, especially if you're mixing fruits and vegetables. Uh, this is a a big issue for autoimmune disease and and fermentation in the stomach and and so yeah beware the more you weigh the more fat you have the more that fat is poorly attended to and it starts going rancid we call it lipid peroxidation and so especially the fat that's around your organs within your uh rib cage within your abdomen fat around your Kidneys, fat around your intestines, fat around your liver, fat around your lungs. This fat is higher temperature all the time, and it goes bad. And if you don't attend to it, it puts little bits of oxidized fat in your bloodstream all the time. Affects your brain. Your blood-brain barrier affects your gut. Your gut to barrier, or you know, makes it leaky. It affects all kinds of things. And so, obesity is a much dreaded disease that causes other diseases, autoimmune disease particularly, increases the risk by 275%. Now, when you overeat, it also causes inflammation. And here we are coming up on Thanksgiving in America, it's sort of the overeating day. <laughs> I'm not sure what that has to do with Thanksgiving, but anyway, excess calories uh, will cause excess free radicals, excess oxidative stress. On the other hand, reducing caloric intake is marvelous. What's, what's we call it um, caloric restriction. So instead of eating 2000 calories, you eat 1200 calories. That would be good. That would be good. So there you go. Now, heavy metals, where do you get heavy metals? Like, uh, for example, uh, mercury. Well, mercury's in fish. Mercury's in high fructose corn syrup. Um, mercury's in your teeth uh, if you get a silver colored spilling. And um, there's other heavy metals too, though uh, beryllium, lead, nickel, cadmium, uh, uh, chromium, vanadium, uh, cobalt. And so, if you're having trouble with heavy metals, you can do tests to, to test for them. Usually the simple screening test is a hair test, uh, but there's other tests. Anyway, um, heavy metals are a problem. Avoid heavy metals in your teeth. Avoid uh, high fructose corn syrup. Uh, we said that there's aluminum in cheese, so avoid cheese. Um, yeah. Another problem in our modern environments is all the indoor air and its toxins 
uh, coming from uh, molds and and uh, cooking with gas inside your house, uh, breathable dust, uh, your skin flecking off, formaldehyde and all the paints and carpets and, and uh, textiles in your house. Um, and then if you live near traffic, for example, if your house is within 200 feet of a busy highway, your risk of autoimmune disease goes up. So what we wanna do is restore and maintain the immune system. So we've talked about all the things now that will destroy it. We need to restore and maintain the immune system, improve it. And so things like getting out in the morning in fresh air, occupations which involve physical work in the open air are productive, they're protective. And uh, while working in the artificial air conditioned environments, increase the risk of an autoimmune disease. You don't wanna be inside with, with the climate control all the time. So that climate control rarely gives you fresh air. And at night, you want your window open for fresh air. Otherwise, you're rebreathing the same air all the time. And all those toxins we talked about in your air will be there. Uh, sunshine is very helpful. It's vitamin D is important. Also, it's uh, infrared uh, um, will help to increase the melatonin in your mitochondria and your cells. Um, getting your sleep, uh, we already talked about this, but this lowers inflammation, uh, lowers your risk of an autoimmune disease. Having a tight schedule with meals, uh, not late in the evening, better no evening meals. Uh, recommending regularity and exercise is also beneficial. It increases your endorphins, which help fight to autoimmune disease and pain. Uh, exercise, people say, I can't exercise, I've got pain, especially if they have rheumatoid arthritis, but people who exercise who have rheumatoid arthritis or some other uh, autoimmune arthritis actually improve over time. It doesn't cause more pain, the pain reduces, and it doesn't cause more joint deterioration. They actually stay the same or improve. And so exercise is very good, especially outdoors and fresh air and sunshine. People who don't drink enough water have more autoimmune disease. If you're not drinking water, you will be dehydrated. Your blood will be thicker. Any inflammation will be increased. And so drinking water is a way of getting your body to get rid of the toxins of inflammation. Drinking water is a way of diluting the toxins of inflammation. Drinking water is a way of hydrating the cells so they function better and they aren't sent over the edge into auto immunity. And, and then in drinking water, citrus, putting lemon in your water is very beneficial. There's bioflavonoids, phytochemicals, antioxidants that to reduce inflammation, improve symptoms of autoimmune disease, help reduce the risk of autoimmune disease. Now, when we look at people who already have an autoimmune disease and we look at their diets, we discover that they are often eating very little in the way of antioxidants. They don't choose lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. They tend to eat lots of grains, and, and other things, or if they're not vegetarian, lots of meats. And so patients suffering from autoimmune disease need to learn to eat their protection. And pills are not the answer. They don't give you really antioxidants. What you want is a proper diet, high in fresh fruits and vegetables, high in good nuts and seeds. So let's look at this for a minute and look at four different diets. We're gonna uh, put up diets here. The first uh, diet will be a standard American diet high fats, oils, processed meats, fried potatoes, salty snacks, and desserts. And if you have that kind of diet, then your inflammation is gonna go up by three times. If you start switching to something that's a little better, which would be beans, tomatoes, refined grains, and high fat dairy, which is otherwise known as Mediterranean diet, your inflammation goes up, goes up just by one time. In other words, you reduced it by two thirds. But if you switch to a diet that's a lot of vegetables, especially dark yellow cruciferous, and, and um, in this diet, they still had a little fish in this diet. I'm just quoting the study here. They reduced their inflammation by one time. But if they went on a whole grain, fruit, nut, green leafy vegetable diet, basically a plant-based diet, then they reduced their inflammation by four times. So you decide how much inflammation you want based on this chart and you pick the diet that will achieve that result for you. Now, in looking at things in the diet that are beneficial, one of the things is omega-3 fatty acids. 
uh, one good source of omega-3 fatty acids would be like olives or flax seeds. These would be good things to get these omega-3s. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. Omega-3s help your blood flow. Uh, omega-3s are definitely going to reduce um, the oxidative stress. And so you definitely want omega-3s. Fresh food, the uncooked diet, you know, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, uh, germinated seeds like sprouts, all full of vitamins. They're nutrient dense. People eating this kind of diet have much less pain, less joint stiffness, better quality of sleep. Um, their health quality is better. Their cholesterol is lower. Their weight is lower. This is the, I mean, what kind of diet are we talking about? Isn't this the creator's diet? Fruits, grains, nuts, seeds, vegetables. Yeah, Genesis 129 and 318. Well, let's talk about how you eat now. You know, if you don't chew your food well, your body has no opportunity to identify what you ingested, and it's more likely to react to it. In your mouth, there are immune tissues, your tonsils, and they're also under your tongue and so forth. Um, and when you chew your food well, the tonsils identify the food and tell the rest of the body not to overreact to this food. And if you don't chew your food well, it can't do that. And so uh, one of the things you can do is just spend a lot more time chewing and uh, uh, making it so you don't react to these foods. Charcoal is very good for inflammation and reducing uh, autoimmune disease or autoimmune symptoms. And you can take it by mouth or you can take it topically on your skin. And what it does is it actually soaks up or adsorbs, AD, adsorbs, uh, inflammatory mediators, interleukin-1, 6, tumor necrosis factor. It sucks up those inflammatory mediators, those cytokines, and makes it so you have less inflammation. Well, we talked about stress as a huge cause of autoimmune disease. Now we've got to talk about the cure for stress. You know, stress is when you can't trust your environment, you can't trust your future, you can't trust yourself. But there is somebody you can trust, and that's God. Spirituality is associated with less depression and increased feelings of health in patients with autoimmune inflammatory disease. So if somebody already has rheumatoid arthritis, if they have a good spiritual experience, they'll have less health problems associated with their autoimmune disease. Studies reveal that religious interventions such as intercessory prayer increase immune function, improve rheumatoid arthritis, and reduce anxiety. So pray for your friends with rheumatoid arthritis. In summary, <clears throat> I'll have a couple of summary slides here. In summary, as you engage in an autoimmune inflammatory disease recovery program, you will find it helpful to eliminate a few things. All foods or drinks created by aging or fermenting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Stimulants like coffee, tea, tobacco, and alcohol. Strong, irritating spices, refined foods, sugar, starches, grains, and oils. Avoiding oxidized oils and cholesterol, animal products, including dairy and eggs. Even wheat gluten, avoid it. Tight clothing, clothing that doesn't provide adequate warmth. Excess body weight, excess dietary calories, excess meals. It's especially helpful to skip supper. On the other hand, as you engage in autoimmune recovery program, you'll find it helpful to have a regular schedule throughout the day for sleeping, eating, and exercise. Eat a whole plant food diet with plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables, omega-3s, and fiber. Chew your food thoroughly and uh, make use of pure water, drinking plenty of it, bathing in it, performing hot and cold treatments if you need to. Make wise application of charcoal as poultices and... Uh, taken by mouth. Well, are we forgetting something? You know, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead, Jesus told the Jews. You can do everything right and still die. What you really need 
You want to live for the long haul. Jesus said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And so focus on Jesus and his word. And this will be a big help to the stress problems that are often underpinning our immune disease. Now, if you go to our website, northernlightshealtheducation.com or rev14.com, you'll find that we have presentation handouts. That's right here, this button right here. And if you go there, you can download a written form of this, of this uh, lecture. All right, very good. I'm going to close out the PowerPoint here so I can go back to just the Zoom panel. And uh, I'm gonna shut down the screen share so that I can uh, go right here. There we go. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Brother John. I have a whole list of questions for you. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> One more hour. Uh, first, I want to ask you a question. It's a friend of mine here. She has... Uh, uh, I don't think she matter if I tell her you that she has a very serious kind of cancer, and uh, and you were saying something that um, it could come inflammation in the blood in the blood whale or you know arterias because of uh, spices and salt, especially salt. And then her question is, but what about those who have too low, too little salt? Because she has much too little salt, and it's a problem. They, they, hard, they would let her out of the hospital because she was too low in salt. Um, so what are you suggesting? Yeah, sometimes you have to look and see if there's another reason why they're low in salt. Um, I mean, you can't imagine that uh, Adam had a salt shaker. So you have to ask yourself, well, why am I low in salt? And it might be some other lifestyle habit that is uh, causing a, a salt imbalance. So I wouldn't just assume that the cure then to low salt is to eat more salt. It's kind of like the medicine uh, approach to diabetes where your blood sugar is high, let's push it down. Well, the question needs to be, why is it high? Not, can we push it down? And so I would say, uh, this is where Ellen White says, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the case of disease, the cause should be ascertained. And so she should sort of go on an investigation to figure out why her salt is haywire before she starts just uh, applying, uh, you know, remedies that might not really be a cure. So, um, you know, she's eating really healthy. She's mostly on raw food and she's exercising and all these things. The uh -huh. problem, well, I think one of the problems she has is EMF because she lives very close to a 5G. Does that have something? I mean, I know that that has really many bad side effects, but could it also influence the salt, uh, you know, metabolism or what you call it? Well, we definitely know that 5G or at least the, the 4G uh, affects the calcium channels in the body. And when it affects the calcium channels, this is like little gates on every cell, it messes with your electrolytes. And so people near, uh, near high EMF sources end up with, with uh, heart irregularities, arrhythmias, because of their electrolyte imbalance from the EMF. And so I would suspect that that could be definitely something to look into. And so you could test it by going on a you know, a vacation where there's no EMF for, for a month and, and see what it does for your, your sodium. So, uh, you know, it will be really interesting. I think you were talking about that last time here too. It would be interesting to have you and Barbara nail together because it seems like sometimes, just a few times, you are saying different things. So how are we as laymen knowing, you know, what to really 
just like coconut oil, for instance. I mean, she suggests to use some coconut oil a day and some olive oil. I have never liked coconut oil. I, I have never liked oils at all. So it's not hard for me to not use oils. But I'm thinking about those to use oils. How are they to... I mean, my uh, philosophy has always been try to get this in the way the Lord made it. And he didn't make the oil. Yeah. Um, but I also know that Sister Wise says that if you have some kind of, if I remember that right now, some kind of inflammation in the in the stomach, it would be good to use some charcoal and some olive oil, right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Sometimes we use for medicine what we wouldn't otherwise use daily for foods. Um. And so that's one thing. Um, so what about, uh, yeah, coconut oil? Um, I went through this. I grew up eating margarine. I never thought about it until I got uh, later in life. And I looked at the margarine and Ellen White says, you should eat food free from grease. And I'm looking at the margarine and I say, it looks like grease. It feels like grease. <laughs> it... Uh, spreads on bread like grease why isn't this grease so i said okay i'm gonna quit eating grease so then i went to the supermarket and they had liquid margarine so i bought some liquid margarine well i looked on the ingredients and it had partially hydrogenated vegetable oil well partially hydrogenated means it's uh, half messed up and it makes it into trans fat so i said okay that can't be good so I quit using that. Well, after that, I switched to almond butter and uh, nut butters uh, as 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 my sort because they wouldn't be, you know, really grease. Um, so coconut oil, most of the time it's grease. Um, it's saturated fat. Studies show it has the same inflammatory uh, effects as lard, which is our quintessential animal saturated fat and so i just go on you know this thing looks like lard. it looks like uh, grease so i guess it's probably not something i should put in my body because that's probably the way it's going to look in my blood vessels just like it looks in the you know the jar that's all thick with you know white and greasy so yeah i avoid it and i if i and just you know personal experience one day I was at somebody's house. I was making waffles and uh, they didn't have anything but coconut oil. I said, okay, I'm going to use coconut oil in the waffle iron to keep the waffles from sticking to it. I ate a couple of those waffles. I felt like my head had just gone uh, retarded. I mean, it's like, wow, I can't think. My head doesn't work. I thought, I'm not going to eat any more. No more coconut oil for me. <laughs> so what would you suggest to do is not to have the dough stick when you make waffles? Well, we would use a spray whose uh, nonstick properties are really lecithin. Um, I know they stick different oils with their lecithin, but the real active ingredient, most of the nonstick sprays is, is lecithin. Because um, you don't want something to stick. And so we, uh, we do put that on there. We put on either olive oil or, or usually a spray, spray with olive oil in it. So you say that it's better to, to use olive oil than coconut oil? Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, you were talking about uh, almond butter. And I, I, was, uh, I was thinking to ask you, but you have to roast the almonds, right? Before you make the butter. At least uh, I do that. I think it's both for the taste and also to have, to make it smooth. Yes, uh, you can buy a raw almond butter. We, we have it over here in different stores. Uh, you just have to run it through your, um, your processor for a longer amount of time. And, uh, and it, uh, it might help also to make up a batch of it. And then when you need to use it, add a little bit of water-based uh, uh, or just water to to make it more spreadable. Uh, that would probably make more sense uh, than adding some kind of a processed oil to make it spreadable. But 
Uh, so you kind of, the other thing is if you're going to make your almond butter, you can determine how much you cook them. So I used to make almond butter. I've made some raw, I made some roasted. And what I would do is put the almonds into the uh, oven at a temperature quite a bit below the temperature at which water boils and just leave them there for a longer time. And then I would crack them open every now and then to see if they're just starting to brown under the skin. And when they just start to brown under the skin, then I would quit and then I would run them through my processor and they would make good almond butter. So the least amount of roasting, I suppose, commercially, they put almonds on a conveyor belt um, oven system and they run them through the oven at a very high temperature as fast as they can so they can get a lot of them roasted quickly. And that's gonna be where you're gonna pick up the most trans fat. Right. Dr. Jim, to another question. You know, uh, I have heard that most diseases are, or parasites are involved in most diseases. And you were talking about MS. And I was listening to this study that uh, they took several MS patients and they all had parasites in the bone marrow. Yeah, it's true. A lot of times they're finding now that there is uh, oftentimes in MS and not only uh, not only just a, perhaps a parasite, but a combination of maybe parasites, bacteria, and viruses. And so the bacteria and viruses seem to work synergistically in the brain. And uh, so one of the things we've gone to doing that uh, Loma Linda actually did in the day was to do fever treatments on multiple sclerosis patients, which goes against all conventional uh, wisdom. And uh, yeah, it helps. Um, and I had a, I, when I was out, when I was uh, practicing orthopedics, there was a, a family doc that was treating rheumatoid arthritis he would take these patients to his clinic and do IV antibiotics on them. He would give them mega doses of a very strong antibiotic and he was, they would be cured for a year. And then they'd come back in another year and get another dose of antibiotics. So it just, you know, it didn't make any sense at all if it was just totally autoimmune. So yeah, so you, and the antibiotic he was giving was one that would be used both for certain lung diseases and for parasites. Uh, minocycline. And so it, it's very interesting that, yeah, you can have, have that. And so a lot of those health laws in, in, in the Bible, especially surrounding um, not uh, getting in contact with sick people or dead animals, probably related to, you know, parasites and, and certainly bacteria and viruses. I have got lots of parasites and worms. I got the uh warm out of me higher than me and i'm 180 centimeter and i using mms oh i don't know if well. you're familiar with that but uh, it's really yeah anyway uh next it's question oh yeah maybe want to say something yeah yeah mms a bit of a scary proposition it isn't exactly a natural means <laughs> it's sort of a chemical <laughs> right but it got it out at least, <laughs> praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, we were talking about the skin uh, and you were sharing with us that the skin is acid. So, but most yeah. creams are alkaline. So we should use a cream which is acid actually, right? Uh, without preservatives. What would you say about using coconut oil on the skin? Yeah, on the skin, it would be good. Another good one is uh, shea butter, uh, but you can use any oil. People often use almond oil as a massage uh, oil. Um, you can use those, and oils would not be as much, uh, they're not water-based, and pH is water-based, so they wouldn't have an acid or an alkali effect in most cases. Okay. Then uh, uh, when we come up in my age, you know, people start to get sometimes uh, brown spots. How, is there a way to get rid of them? 
Yes, a lot of times those brown spots are a result of eating processed oils. And they're often oily. Uh, Subbureic keratosis is what we call a lot of them. And we've had people that changed their diet, to, got off of processed oils, and those brown spots start disappearing. And, and so that would be my, my take is to watch uh, what the source is of your fats when those things show up. Amen. Amen. Um, yeah, so we were talking about, Sister Wise says that 90% of disease come from our thoughts, our mind, how we are thinking. Uh, and I have also heard that, you know, I shouldn't say most other problems comes from the teeth. When you speak to people, are you talking about dental, no, having taken the root canals out and the mercury? Yeah, definitely. A root canal is basically a way of killing the tooth. The tooth is dead, and then it can become a nidus for infection. Your immune system has no access to it. When they do a root canal, they drill down through the root, kill all the blood supply, and then they stick a, a putty down in there. And that putty can uh, get the bacteria in it. We've had people that uh, until they got rid of their root canals or their implants were seriously sick. And then when they got rid of those, it made a major difference. Um, so yeah, you don't want to you don't want anything dead and foreign in your body. Amen. Cayenne pepper. Have you heard about the book Back to Eden? Yeah. <laughs> oh, he oh. talks so much. I mean, he's, he's he writes just a little bit about different herbs when it comes to cayenne pepper he has i think it's 10 pages if i remember right you know and he's talking about all the benefits so how can we distinguish when you say we should be careful about it and then you know others say you know it's really a good herb right so again using it topically is uh, the way to use it uh and it decreases pain, it improves uh, blood flow. Uh, it also stops bleeding if you have a wound. But um, as a ingredient in food, it kind of falls under what Ellen White talks about, fiery spices and fiery tempers. I spent some time in a country where uh, fiery spices and, and you know cayenne peppers and other peppers were, were, were the usual part of the diet. And everybody there had a hot temper. Until I went to a, a little South Sporting uh, uh, school that was run by Wildwood, and everybody was easy to get along with. I said, you guys are so easy to get along with. I says, how do you account for that? I expected they would say, you know, well, Jesus Christ. Or they said, well, we don't eat the peppers. <laughs> and it was true. They didn't eat the peppers, and they had easy to get along with dispositions. Um, the thing about these peppers is that for one thing, there's nothing magic about cayenne. If you go down to the store and you buy, at least in America, a, a spice jar full of cayenne, it will be any number of peppers there. There's no one pepper that just is identified as cayenne. It can be chili peppers, it can be, you know, habaneros, it can be whatever. It's just whatever the, you know, pepper du jour, the pepper of the day. So you're not guaranteed of getting one particular variety. What's more, I couldn't find anything in my research, anything magic of, of pepper uh, that was cayenne or habaneros or, or, or any of the other hot peppers uh, that are, are, are very common in, say, Mexican food or Korean food or Japanese food or, or whatever. And so it's a bit of a you know, a, 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 what do we call it? Superstition that cayenne has magic to it. And so, yeah, it has some properties we use topically, but you know, there's other things you can use as well. Uh, bell peppers, which aren't fiery hot, banana peppers, which aren't fiery hot. They still have a lot of the good ingredients. Uh, they just don't have, you know, the fire in them. And so you can eat those and uh, see if they won't uh, fix the problem without having to have a fiery pepper. I remember my first experience with cayenne pepper. I was working at the health center in Norway and there was a lady who had put a sharp knife in the water where you do the dishes. 
And then another person came to do the dishes and she didn't know about the knife. So she really get the deep, deep cut. And her husband said, let's run to the hospital. You have, you know, to sew here. And she said, no, give me the cayenne pepper. And she poured the cayenne pepper on and the bleeding just stopped. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, we've been um, can we be too low in cholesterol? You can be too low in cholesterol. Yeah, yeah. We have a whole talk on cholesterol, which we sort of sort that out. If you're too low in cholesterol, your brain doesn't work well. You get depressed. Uh, you can't make hormones well. Your blood vessels and your cells lack uh, suppleness because cholesterol is sort of like the the BPA of the cell membrane, it softens it. Uh, you can be too low in it. And, uh, but it's, 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 it's sort of uncommon to be too low in it, especially in this day and age. Uh, the type of people to get too low in it are people in the ICU on ventilators. If they start going low on cholesterol, it's sort of um, the, the sign that they're about to die. <laughs> so what is too low? That's a good question. Um, well, there is a normal range if you have your blood taken. Um, for us, we have, I don't think our ranges are the same as your ranges, but if you just go by that normal range and uh, figure if you're within that normal range, uh, the closer you are to the bottom of it, the better, but uh, not being too close to the bottom. So we have a range that uh, we usually say 140 is uh, what we're shooting for, but I don't think you guys, I think you guys are probably, you know, looking around three or something would be, I can't right. remember. Yeah, right. Yeah. Three point, you know, when I have 3.8 or something like that, I get the star, you're too low. <laughs> but uh, is it really too low or is just because normal is higher? Well, you kind of have to go by the way you feel. Uh, reasoning, cause, effect, and seeing how you feel. If, if if you know you're getting depressed and feeling suicidal and you check your cholesterol and it's 2.8, then you could probably attribute it to your low cholesterol. And then you'd have to ask yourself, what am I going to do to increase it? And of course, for a good healthy person, the cholesterol that you need is made by your liver. So if I had a low cholesterol and I was worried about it, I would start focusing on liver health. And that would be involve eating cruciferous vegetables, uh, doing hot and cold treatments and charcoal poultices over the liver, um, doing things that uh, help the liver to function exercise wise. I would just focus on liver health rather than eating something that forced the body to to raise cholesterol from a you know an unhealthy point of view. Mm -hmm. So another jump. Uh, we were talking about uh, not being in rooms with fungus, but what are you thinking about eating mushrooms? Oh yeah, I do whole talk on on mushrooms and fermented food, and mushrooms are just another form of filamentous mold, uh, fungi, and uh, they uh, unlike a, so if I had a mushroom growing, and I had a tomato plant growing on the same pile of say animal manure, the mushroom has no photosynthesis. The mushroom has no way of taking stuff out of the air and making itself grow, it entirely depends on the medium which it's growing. So you will get animal manure toxins into that mushroom. The tomato depends on photosynthesis and carbon in the air to add to its size. And so it's not going to be sucking up so much, quite so much of what's in, in the animal manure. And so if you grow mushrooms on a land that has heavy metals, your mushrooms will have heavy metals. If you grow mushrooms on land that has um, pesticides and herbicides, they'll be right in that mushroom. And so if you had the same mushroom grown on perfect media, it may not have toxins, but if it's grown on un, you know, described media, media that with, with hazardous materials, it'll be hazardous. Uh, we know there's a lot of mushrooms that are just plain dangerous out there, but uh, of these mushrooms that people eat, and we have a mushroom factory near where we live. We get their mushroom mulch, we call it, what they grew the mushrooms on and use it for compost. But anyway, uh, they grow button mushrooms, organic button mushrooms. 
But study after study has shown these mushrooms are carcinogenic. It makes me wonder why they're even on the market. Even the common little round oyster mushrooms or, you know, and so to me, they are, they don't fit the Genesis picture of every, every tree bearing seed. They don't have seeds, they have spores. I mean, it's kind of like they're, they grow through, go through a lifestyle or a life cycle that isn't even necessarily plant, you know. So I don't think God gave them to us to eat in the beginning. I don't think there's any nutritional deficiency we have for which we need them. And I think they're hazardous in that they have aflatoxins and mycotoxins and sometimes even worse toxins that are plain deadly. Okay. And uh, then uh, since uh, we are not supposed to have vinegar and oil for dressing, what kind of dressing are you making? Well, on my website, I have a number of recipes. Uh, most of the time, it's like lemon juice, nuts and seeds, and herbs, and salt, and you blend it up and make your dressing. And so it doesn't have any oil, doesn't have any vinegar, uses lemon juice for the sour part. You could also, you know, if you're wanting another sour thing, you could use uh, uh, rhubarb, which is a sour vegetable with the, the stem being used most of the time. Um, but anyway, uh, we make it from scratch with a blender, nuts and seeds and lemon juice. Another question is, some people say, don't eat too much spinach. Is it true? If you have the problem of developing kidney stones, uh, spinach can uh, exacerbate that through its high oxalate levels. But then again, the cure for high oxalate levels or kidney stones is what we call the lemon juice cure. Lemon juice cure is uh, like this. The first day you take a glass of water and you squeeze the juice of one lemon into it. Second day, two lemons. Third day, three lemons. All the way up to day eight, eight lemons. And then you reverse the process. Ninth day, seven lemons. Tenth day, you know, all the way back down to zero lemons. And I've had people who are chronically having kidney stones repeatedly going for lithotripsy uh, totally cure their problem. Never have to go back to the doctor again for, for kidney stones. So, yeah, if you have trouble with oxalate from spinach and get are getting stones, just use the lemon juice cure. So would that also be, you know, I have a friend, she has some big uh, kidney stones. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, use that for sure. Okay, so how much flax or shea should we use today? I don't know. I'll tell you that the, the effect of flax, uh, the larger quantities you get, the more it thins your blood. Um, so for going into surgery, we would uh, find out how much flax somebody might be on in case they might be a higher risk for more bleeding. It definitely increased bleeding. But uh, if you're all healthy and well and, and so forth, uh, I don't know that I have heard of a upper level of how much you can eat. Um, it is a seed. So it's a little more concentrated than eating a grain in, in some respects with oils and other things. So we tend to be moderate on the use of those. So if you took it and called it or compared it to nuts, which Ellen White says uh, in, in some recipes, she recommended no more than 10 to 15% of nuts. So maybe we should say flax would probably fall in that same category. And so no more than 10 to 15% of the diet as flax. So would that be a reasonable comparison yeah i heard this dr uh, brooke i don't know if you heard about her but she suggests uh, half a cup of chia and flax every day well it's probably i mean eating both of them so a total of a whole cup of seeds no half a cup half a cup mm. one or the other yeah well that's probably the upper end of of the amount that you'd probably want to eat. Last question from me, maybe the others have some other questions, but uh, nightshades, some people say we should be, or some quite many people with autoimmune diseases, especially maybe leaky gut, are reacting on nightshades. Are you, you know, what kind of, what are you thinking about that? Well, I'll tell you the story on nightshades. Um, First of all, if you are allergic to nightshades, obviously you should avoid them. 
But in the big population studies, there's no more higher incidence of allergy to nightshades than there is to say tomatoes, chocolate, milk, um, and any other of the common peanuts or the, or the other common allergens. And so what happened is there was a doctor in Connecticut, United States by the name of Dr. Childers that spent his entire career trying to convince the world that nightshades were the enemy. And he did a pretty good job of it. Mm. Now, I used to have a lady that uh, I took care of, and every time she went to the internet, she discovered she had a different disease, and it was caused by a different thing. <laughs> and uh, and it was like, okay, don't read the internet anymore, because I don't want you to get that disease too. So people go and read on the internet that nightshades are the problem, and pretty soon they are the problem, because they thought so. And so this kind of gets in the mind-body connection. So statistically, there's no evidence that it's any worse than any other common allergen. But there are some good things in, in, uh, in nightshades that can be beneficial. Uh, this can, you know, nightshades include everything from eggplant, potatoes, tomatoes, uh, um, uh, peppers. Um, but uh, for me, I had trouble with potatoes because they were sprayed with glyphosate before they're harvested. If I eat organic potatoes, I'm good. But if I eat glyphosate sprayed potatoes, I'm bad. I get I get to blisters in my mouth. Hmm. So maybe we can ask you the last question. Maybe I said that for the last question too. What are you having for breakfast? Well we have a lot of interesting things. This morning I had some um, what we call honey dew melon. Um, let's see, what else did I have? I had, uh, I'm trying to, oh yeah, we had uh, waffles we make in a waffle iron that doesn't have baking soda. So I had a couple of waffles. I had some fruit spread on that. Uh, I had some grapes. Uh, I had, uh, uh i think it was a pear a lot of fresh fruit um so we try to do well i had over half of my breakfast as fresh fruit we shoot for over half of our our meals fresh fruit so when you are saying don't mix more than three or four you know things in a meal you are not thinking about one apple one pear how are you thinking you know when we should not mix too many things. How, you know, some people are confused about that. Yes. Uh, and um, it, again, it goes back to reasoning cause to effect. If I'm not feeling well, try simplifying the diet, see what happens. And you can even go an elimination diet where you just go and you fast today and then just start adding back one thing at a time. And uh, and that would be a way of, of, of figuring that out. So yeah, there's some some dishes that people make, entrees that might have 20 ingredients. And so you're like, okay, are we talking? Uh, I think I, I would tend to, to, to look at it from the point of view of what is compatible. Uh, so fruits and vegetables aren't compatible, so you wouldn't eat those at the same meal. But uh, so some people wouldn't do very good with say nut butters and fruit because they're you know, quite different. Some people do very good with them together. Ellen White talked to one man and said, well, you can eat coarse vegetables, but your wife can't. So don't try to feed her coarse vegetables. She won't survive or she won't do well. And so a lot of it has to do with your own personal constitution. So we, so if I, okay, okay, I'll give you an example. Potluck. I mentioned potluck. So when I go to potluck, first thing I do is I do what I call my drive by. I look up and down the tables and I say, okay, am I going to fare better today on fruits or vegetables? Because I'm not going to mix the two. So I might look over there. There's a nice vegetable salad that somebody hasn't put any dangerous dressing on. And uh, over here is some steamed broccoli. That's great. Over there is a pot of beans that looks fairly benign. Okay, those are the three dishes I'm going to have for this meal. Steamed broccoli, uh, pot of beans, and salad. And I might mix them together. And then if I go back for seconds, I only go back for the pot of beans or the broccoli or the salad, nothing else. I keep it to those three three items. 
But you might say within the salad, there's four different types of greens. Okay, but they're all greens. You might say within the beans, you know, they might have a few ingredients, but uh, I'm trying to look for something that doesn't have too many ingredients. Right. And if the, those dishes has all gone, then you just starve until next meal. <laughs> yeah, caloric restriction. <laughs> right. right. So maybe, John, would you like to have a closing prayer, please? Okay. Dear Father in heaven, it's been good to think about health and uh, autoimmune disease. It's uh, quite an extensive topic with lots of intricacies. And Lord, we pray that as each person takes this information, you'll give them wisdom how to apply it, that it can be a blessing to their lives and that they can have freedom from inflammation and uh, autoimmune disease. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.